Welcome back to Eye on Iowa. I'm Sarah Mueller, a reporter with Forbes. I'm joined today by University of Iowa professor Tim Hagel, and we're going to be talking about Governor Ron DeSantis' announcement last night via Twitter. So just to get started, Professor, what are your thoughts on the big announcement? Well, it was certainly something that was going to be an interesting approach, something new, dealing with new technology. And of course, Elon Musk has been in the news for a while now for various reasons, not least of which was the, his takeover of Twitter and thing changes there. Uh, unfortunately for Musk and DeSantis, it didn't work. Uh, that the system, as Musk indicated, was strained. The servers are strained, and that was an understatement. And as a result, things it was kind of a, a disappointment. But uh, fortunately for DeSantis, he, it wasn't his only scheduled interview that he did one that was on radio and also did one on television that also was announced his announcement. And then, of course, he's going to start his official campaign next week here in Iowa. But, uh, it, you know, it was it was one of those kinds of things that you try to take advantage of new technology, see if that's something new that you can incorporate into campaigns. And I think ultimately it probably will under some circumstances, but just at least last night's version didn't work out very well. And obviously this series is really focused on Iowans. And let's even talk about rural Iowans. Will this connect with them? His announcement on Twitter, will that connect with Iowans rather than having a big stage event with, with a bunch of people being broadcast on, on big networks? Well, one of the things that I heard some folks talk about this morning, and I more or less agree with it, is saying that, well, you know, this Twitter spaces thing, is, as one person put it, is essentially a conference call. And a conference call really isn't necessarily the place you want to start a campaign in that respect, or at least not traditionally so. The thing is, though, is that you do have an awful lot of people and potentially an awful lot of people that would be reached by something like this beyond Iowa, well beyond Iowa, uh, and again, given the, the popularity of Musk and so forth. So it had that potential to reach a huge number of people. But you still want to have something fairly quickly where people can see you, which you couldn't do on the Twitter space. Even if it worked, it was still, again, more or less like a conference call. You want to have something where people can see you because that visual aspect is often important. But of course, for us in Iowa, we want to see the person in person. And so that's why he's going to be starting his campaign next week, where basically he's going to show up at a, a couple of towns in Iowa and start having rallies and, and events of various sorts that are going to basically be the start of the campaign. Now, one thing that I've been talking about with a couple people lately is kind of the innovation coming with this new election cycle. We have two candidates, one Republican and one Democrat, who are now taking Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for donations. And I find this fascinating. I, I talked to our kind of crypto expert, Michael Del Castillo, about this in a separate interview that typically the Republican side has always been kind of more traditional in, in some of these innovations and all of a sudden we're seeing them lean into them. And we're seeing now with the Twitter space, obviously last night's announcement. So is this gonna work in their favor? Do you see more of this happening? Um, how do you think that's gonna impact DeSantis' electability? One of the things that we've often seen, as you indicated, is that Republicans have been more traditional, which uh, putting it another way is that they've also uh, also been slow to adapt to new changes, whether it's technological or techniques that are used in campaigns, whatever it happens to be. And so this with cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or whatever it happens to be, this is just another one of those things. Now, sometimes these new innovations work, sometimes they don't. And usually the, the key as to whether they work is that if Democrats adopt it first and it seems to work for them in terms of whatever it happens to be, that then Republicans maybe say, eh, maybe we need to get in on this too, because otherwise we're being left behind. And that's really how it goes. And the area that I'm a little more familiar with is with absentee ballots and, and early voting that Republicans traditionally, and this is still the case, that traditionally like to vote on election day. And that's why you see a, a higher turnout of Republicans on election day. But the problem for Republicans in some cases is that Democrats have a lot of early votes that are in the bank with, uh, with absentee ballots and early voting and ballot harvesting and all those sorts of things. And now you're starting to finally see some Republicans realizing that, hey, we better get onto this, this bandwagon as well. And the same is true with any other technological advance or again technique is that you have to see what works and if it does work you can't be afraid to adopt it and give it a try. 
Now, obviously, Ron DeSantis has waited a, quite a while to announce, and, and we've all been waiting for it, and it finally happens. And a lot of people said it was because he wanted to get done with the Florida legislation and, and kind of get some championship out of that. Uh, do you think what he's done in office this spring specifically uh, will help him with Iowa voters? He's passed some really controversial le legislation. Yeah, as far as DeSantis waiting until May to get in, that it does make sense that he is the governor of Florida, so he does need to take care of his state responsibilities first, because if he didn't, then he would be criticized for that. And so we have seen this in the past. Uh, George W. Bush did the same thing, that he waited until his Texas legislature was done before he officially announced his campaign. But in both instances, you had people either indirectly or uh, working on behalf of the candidates that were setting up the, the ground game that were basically prepping for that eventual campaign. And we saw this with DeSantis uh, most recently, where again, there were a number of people that were out hiring on his behalf and some ads being made on his behalf. So it wasn't that it was totally nothing being done on DeSantis that all of a sudden he's just starting from ground zero today. He's not, he's got pretty much a campaign that's, that's underway. It just wasn't official at this point. In terms of waiting until the, the Florida legislature is done before he makes the announcement that, yes, a number of bits of legislation were passed that undoubtedly DeSantis is going to hail as being, uh, as being his ability to get things done. And as much as some people would classify them as controversial, there are a lot of things that Republicans like in terms of dealing with uh, critical race theory or, you know, whatever it happens to be on some of the, the things that talks about woke agenda and so forth. And so as a result, uh, that's something that he can say that, look, I, as, as a governor, these are the things that we did in Florida and we think they're good things. And even in his uh, seven minute speech that he ended up managing to get on the Twitter thing. Apparently not everybody heard. I certainly didn't hear it, heard, listen to it later where he talked about that. He said, well, these are the things that we got done in Florida. And these tend to be the things that especially a lot of Republicans like. So in that sense, it's not particularly controversial. Now we'll have to see what happens in a general election. Should he be the nominee? But at least for right now, he's got a record that he can run on. And that's an advantage for any candidate. Now let's play pretend for a moment and say that you are his campaign lead and you're going to give him advice about how to approach Iowa. What would be your words of wisdom? Well, the thing about Iowa is, of course, that we like to see the candidates. We like to have candidates come in and, you know, look the voters in the eye, shake their hand and tell them where you stand kind of a, a thing. And so showing up is important. Now, again, that's the traditional kind of campaign. And so we see that for other uh, candidates, and especially if you're somebody that's not well known, uh, DeSantis, because he's been in the news a lot, especially if you're uh, more politically oriented, that you're following the news, that you know that he's done these things in Florida, uh, and which got him the national attention, which now has sort of thrust him onto the national stage. So you're probably aware, but you still want to hear him say it. You want to hear him make these arguments. And I think that's particularly true, given that he's been relatively silent on these things for the last several months, even though he's been under sustained attack from Trump uh, and sometimes the media as well. And then also other candidates. We saw Nikki Haley starting to complain about some of the things DeSantis has done or said or whatever it happens to be. And so DeSantis hasn't really been in a position where he could fire back. Well, now he is. And so now he's got to be, be able to answer some of those criticisms, uh, whatever they happen to be. And, and basically it's game on at this point. I'm so glad you brought that up because obviously our former president, Donald Trump, has made numerous comments about DeSantis and they used to be friends and, and now they're at odds. So what is this going to, what are, what are we going to see unfold now that DeSantis can kind of um, come back and, and say some more things maybe about Trump that Trump has been kind of railing on him in, in the media? Well, different people have different ideas as far as what what strategy DeSantis should use in dealing with Trump. And of course, one of the things that DeSantis has to do is to lure some Trump voters over to his side. And he should be able to do that with some people. Uh, certainly the, the people, the never Trump people, a lot of them that never, didn't vote for him, they may vote for DeSantis, although some of those folks may have ended up becoming Democrats. So who knows on that score? But you also have a number of people that Republicans that 
eventually supported Trump, even though they were not thrilled about it, that because of Trump's approach, his style, that they didn't really care for whatever it happened to be, some particular thing that he said or did, but they liked his policies. And so even if they may have been really hesitant in 2016, they were certainly willing to vote for him in 2020, uh, although, of course, not in sufficient numbers to be able to win the election. But Trump is still Trump, and he's going to be saying these things and firing off these things. And so perhaps a strategy, or at least what someone suggested might be a good strategy, is not necessarily take on Trump directly, but take it on indirectly and talking about saying, well, and in fact, he even did this in his, his uh, Twitter speech last night where he talked about how, well, you know, I, people are not going to like me. They're going to call me names, but, you know, that's OK, because, uh, you know, I live in a country that has freedom sort of thing. I can't recall how exactly how he phrased it, but it was along those lines where he's just going to kind of shrug off some of that stuff, that name calling kind of a thing and basically talk about policies and talk about here are the policies. Here's how I can get things done. This is what we need to do and I'll do it. And basically that kind of a straightforward approach, an indirect sort of a approach in terms of not directly criticizing Trump, but still sort of suggesting that, well, we can do better, might be the way to lure over a number of voters. Now, they're going to be a segment of the voters that are hardcore Trump supporters, and it's Trump or nothing. He's never going to win those folks over. But the question is, uh, for Republicans in general, should be, can they win? Can they get a candidate that's going to win? And that's the concern that a lot of folks have, that if Trump's the nominee, will he be able to win? Well, he didn't win in 2020. And so to some extent, even a lot of media folks and Democrats would certainly like to see Trump again because they think that Biden can beat him again. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. I might remind everybody that, well, you thought that uh, he was going to lose to Hillary Clinton in 2016 and he didn't. So you never know what you're going to get. So basically, that's kind of where we're at. And DeSantis has to find some way again to lure over those Trump voters or at least enough of them so that he gets the nomination so that he has a shot then of going up against, we presume, Joe Biden. There's a lot to unpack there. And I want to quickly start with uh, DeSantis versus Trump, because I went to the Trump rally a couple of weeks ago that notoriously got canceled due to Tornado Watch. Um, but when I was talking to to people who were attending, most of them were were very against uh, DeSantis initially because they felt like he had betrayed Trump and their friendship. But at the same time, I asked them, you know, who would you vote for other than Trump or who would you support as the GOP nomination? And every single one of them had said DeSantis. So there's it seems like there's a pretty good chance that he could sway some of those voters if things were to shake out a certain way. Is that true? I think that's true. And again, that's a, the sort of the if things shake out that way is a, is a key point in the sense that what's going to happen with Trump with some of the things that he's got going on in the legal front that we still have. Uh, three investigations going on with respect to Trump, one in Georgia and two with the Department of Justice. And the ones that we've seen so far, whether it's the E. Jean Carroll thing or the, the, the New York district attorney indicting Trump, those seemed a little bit shaky, but still it kind of adds to the drama that surrounds Trump. And it may give, if people want to make this argument, gave Democrats an ag additional ability to criticize Trump. And they demonized him very thoroughly, basically from the start of his presidency. And that allowed them to ultimately win in 2020 with Joe Biden. Will they be able to demonize Trump again? Well, now they've got some additional things. And whether you agree with whatever it was that the New York DA decided to indict Trump on or the Carroll thing or the other investigations, it's still something that may be enough to convince enough independent middle voters to not vote for Trump. And that's something that, again, the other, the non-Trump voters, non-Trump Republican voters may try to emphasize. Now, I don't know if DeSantis is gonna bring that up directly. It's probably going to be something uh, where his allies that are out there or PACs or something of that nature will do sort of that approach, take that approach and have DeSantis take the high ground. But that's kind of the underlying question is, will the no Republican nominee be able to beat Biden? And with Trump, there's some question about it. Now, there's going to be a question about it with, regardless of who the Republican nominee is. But you know with Trump that you've got the Democrats have a lot of ammunition to use against him. I went to a Nikki Haley event last week, and a lot of them were lifelong GOP members, lifelong Republicans who just didn't want to vote for Trump. I had a man outwardly say, look, anything's better than Trump. So 
do you think like that's going to be a lot of the tone as they're approaching Iowa is we have this almost clown car of Republican candidates coming and and they're all just trying to not be Trump? Well, you know, it's kind of a hard thing, and especially with Nikki Haley, because some of the comments she made the other day were more aimed at DeSantis. And several people suggested immediately that, oh, she seems to be auditioning for vice president. Um, and, you know, that's the thing is that Trump's policies are things that Republicans generally liked. The problem that they had with Trump was his style and his approach. Now, having said that, there one of the reasons that Trump actually won in 2016 was that he was, in fact, pugnacious, that he was a fighter. And it became kind of a cliche, oh, you know, Trump supporters, they just think he's a fighter, yada, yada. And they're willing to dismiss all of the, the style points that Trump loses for one reason or another. Well, yeah, because Republicans didn't have somebody that was willing to fight hard for their position, whether it was, you know, Bob Dole or Mitt Romney or John McCain, all decent and honorable men, but didn't seem to be in the eyes of a lot of people that they had the will to fight to get what they, they needed to get, to get their agenda through. And so, and of course, all three lost. And so as a result, the, they were the, a lot of Republicans, a lot of people in the middle wanted somebody that was seen as kind of an outsider, that wasn't part of that, what we call now the deep state or, or so forth, and basically was willing to take on the establishment. Well, Trump did that. And again, not in a very pleasant way to a lot of people, but at a certain point, that kind of approach wears thin. So if you can get somebody from a Republican point of view, if you can get somebody who's willing to fight, but maybe also not going to alienate a lot of people as a result, aside from them not liking the policies, of course, but in terms of the style, that maybe that's a better alternative and would certainly make it harder for the Democrats to attack. Now we're seeing a lot of local politicians here in Iowa, Joni Ernst, um, Zach Nunn, uh, we just had the Feenstra family picnic uh, hosting these events where a lot of these candidates are coming and speaking. Next week, we have Joni's Roast and Ride, which is a motorcycle ride that ends in kind of a picnic format with speeches. And she has Asa Hutchinson coming. She has uh, Perry Johnson, some of the, the lesser known candidates, but she also has Mike Pence coming. And I was just at a Mike Pence event this week, too, and it it was interesting how he was wording things to make sure it was open to interpretation that if he decides to run, um, that you know he would be very interested in obviously campaigning in Iowa and he's, he's keeping that door open. So what do you think that these, these local hosts almost are, are doing for these candidates by hosting these types of events? Well, again, given that this is Iowa and given that we have the caucus season is underway at this point, as, as I said before, it's basically we're game on now that we've got Tim Scott and and uh, Ron DeSantis in. And even though some people like Pence haven't officially declared, and there are a few others floating around that maybe are showing interest, Chris Christie, uh, Youngkin, Sununu and so forth. Uh, basically, uh, you have these events and people will show up to them, whether they're an officially declared candidate or not. And this is what we like to see in Iowa. We want people to show up and it's sometimes it's an event like a community uh, county meeting, something like that, a parade that you're having or again, like the roast and ride or a family picnic or whatever it is. And it helps the local politicians because they're going to meet with their own constituents and so forth. Now, sometimes it's a fundraiser as well. And that's the case for Roast and Ride, where the money is going to, I think it's the Freedom Foundation of Cedar Rapids Help Veterans Groups. And so these are good opportunities for these candidates or potential candidates to get known to increase their name recognition. So again, somebody like uh, uh, Asa Hutchinson in particular, although he's been in politics for a while, former governor of Arkansas, a member of Congress, but he's been off the national stage for a while. And so he's basically got to do things to, to get his name recognition up, to meet Iowans, Iowans that potentially are going to show up for him in caucus on you know some Jan cold night in January. But uh, aside from that, again, it's that good opportunity. You've got to get that campaign started. You've got to start knowing who the local folks are. Are. And a lot of times these politicians aren't necessarily endorsing, or at least not at this early stage, because they want the candidates to come to Iowa. They want them to meet with the, the voters and the constituents. And so that's a, a good thing. And it's part of the caucus process. Now, I just mentioned Mike Pence, obviously former VP to Donald Trump. And the conversation the other night at the event was very much about our administration 
the prior administration, very careful not to mention Trump specifically. So if he does decide to run, what is he going to have to do to make sure he is separate from his former running mate? Pence has the problem that most of the candidates have, where, again, nobody's complaining particularly about Trump's policies, although with some of the stuff that happened with COVID at the end of Trump's administration that you can kind of question that in the sense that he relied on Fauci a lot and Fauci's sort of been dismissed by most Republicans at this point for a variety of reasons. But aside from that, in terms of getting the economy going, working on, you know, uh, border control, things of that nature, Republicans like that. So it's hard for them to really criticize Trump to distinguish themselves from Trump without getting into sort of the personal aspect to it. And that's why it potentially with DeSantis, that despite the name calling by from Trump, that maybe DeSantis's approach needs to be to stay above the fray. Well, Pence has got that problem as well in the sense that he was part of that administration. Now, he really has little or no chance of swaying Trump voters to him because their Trump voters, Trump supporters, the hardcore ones are just not happy with Pence at all, that they would be basically put him into the kind of the uh, Bob Dole, Mitt Romney kind of campaign. We're a nice guy, very conservative. We like your policies, but you're not a fighter. He didn't fight hard enough for Trump. At least that's their view. Now that, that's, you know, again, you can argue against it or for it, whatever you want, but basically that's their view. And so he's not going to get those folks. So he's going to not peel them off. And that's where some of the other candidates need to have some way of distinguishing themselves. Now, Haley, of course, was also in Trump's administration. So she can maybe talk about that or talk about the foreign policy stuff a little bit more. But basically she's in that same boat. And again, with the with Pence right now, he's polling a little bit higher than some of the rest of them, but that's because his name recognition is higher. So people know him where they don't necessarily know some of these other candidates. So that's probably going to change later on. To round us out here, I want to bring up something you mentioned a couple months ago when we spoke about DeSantis entering the race, in which we've talked about this idea of can I have a beer with them, which may not be a perfect guideline to picking a candidate, but it's the idea of um, having a personable candidate that I can talk about the issues with, right? And one thing you had mentioned is he DeSantis doesn't necessarily have that. Um, do you still feel that way? Or, or what do you think his approach to one-on-one -on -one time with Iowans has to be to kind of uh, bring them over to his side. Right. Well, with DeSantis, one of the criticisms that he's gotten a lot, mostly from the press, Trump hasn't really hit on this quite as much, is that he's maybe stiff, he's not particularly comfortable, you know, sort of with those one-on-one -on -one conversations and so forth. But, you know, I, DeSantis really hasn't had the opportunity to dispel that kind of a thing, or at least he didn't until recently, that he had a couple of events here in Iowa. One was the uh, Feenstra family picnic. I'm not sure that's the right name for it, but it was Randy, Randy Feenstra, Congressman Randy Feenstra event. And basically, you know, he put on the red apron, DeSantis put on the red apron, he's flipping the, the, the burgers or pork chops or whatever it happened to be and talking with people and joking around. So, you know, basically, it seemed to dispel some of those concerns that people had about, well, is this somebody who can talk to people or is kind of a, a nice guy? And on the other hand, we also had the former President Trump, where sometimes he wasn't considered that kind of nice guy. Well, certainly can't have a beer with him since he didn't drink. But basically, you know, he wasn't as approachable necessarily, even though he was very charming with people and could talk to them and so forth and that kind of a thing. So each each candidate has sort of a different approach to these things. And I think that we really have to wait and see how they're going to interact with folks in those kind of events. Now, part of the problem with DeSantis right now, though, is that because he is more well known and now his campaign has officially started, he's probably going to not be able to be at some of the really smaller events where he has that opportunity to interact really well. So we're going to basically see how he does, uh, you know, giving speeches and rallies and things of that nature. And so in that sense, it's going to be a lot of comparisons, I'm sure, to Trump. But basically, that's where he's at right now, whereas some of the other candidates, um, Asa Hutchinson, for example, came into my county and talked to the county central committee, answered some questions and something was very personable. And people seem to enjoy having that uh, that uh, presidential candidate come in. And certainly there are going to be others that they'll be able to see and have seen so far. 
but again, where each candidate is at the stage depends on how much they can interact with individual voters. But again, at a minimum, you'd like them to maybe do a rope line, take some selfies, or a lot of people take selfies, shake their hand again, that shake their hand, look them in the eye, tell them where you stand kind of a thing. And so we'll get some of that. And I'm sure DeSantis will probably do fine. He's been successful enough as a politician, both as a member of Congress and now two-time governor of Florida, that he has at least some sense of how this is supposed to work. And undoubtedly people have told him how it works in Iowa with the caucuses that he needs to be able to talk to voters to a certain extent. Uh, but I don't think that if he's a little stiff or seems, I, I don't want to say standoffish, that's going to be more of a problem. But if he's just maybe a little shy about this, I don't think that's going to be a big problem for our Iowa voters. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up the apron and the spatula and, you know, flipping burgers, because I think that photo circulated online with a lot of Iowa reporters. Just it's such a staple. It's such a staple in Iowa to have a politician come here, put on an apron and start flipping burgers at, at a family event. Um, but one thing I wanted to bring up as well is that we have obviously the Iowa State Fair at the end of the year. That's going to be an entire event where people can get personable. And even when when DeSantis came a couple weeks ago, there was a video that Des Moines Register posted and it was of DeSantis with his wife, Casey, and they were talking about the Casey's General Store, which is such a staple here in Iowa and in the Midwest. And it felt very personable to watch them talk about gas stations, which felt very odd. But his wife specifically, I, I remember there was a lot of people calling out how his wife was almost the more personable one. How do you think she's going to play a role? Well, the the spouse of a candidate can also can always play an important role. And I know that to some people in the media that they've already started attacking Casey DeSantis, which I think is a mistake. And, you know, sometimes you have a, a spouse that is very knowledgeable about these things, is very supportive of the, the husband or the wife, however the, the candidate is, whichever way it works. And so in a such situation like that, it's to be expected that, you know, you wouldn't have. And I'm thinking back long ago where uh, <laughs> Hillary Clinton was saying, you know, I'm not some, I for, gosh, I've forgotten the country star that, you know, this you know, sit home and bake cookies kind of a thing and stand by your man. But that's to some extent what you would expect. And sometimes if a wife is knowledgeable and experienced in the various things that that person can be important for a variety of, of policy things, or just in terms of how you handle handle yourself in terms of what that person's experience is and in terms of, of where they've done in, in their life and how they can say, okay, this is how you should handle yourself or you need to speak louder or, you know, look at the audience, whatever it happens to be, you give it little tips along those lines. And sometimes their experience can help that spouse candidate. 